Hi, this video is the first in a series of building blocks. In the series, we're going to look at different parts of system design. You can be prepared for all system design topics, because interviewer may ask you to design an application you have never seen before. That's why building blocks are important. It's like a constructor kit. You can build any application from them. We will start with real-time updates. If you found this format useful and interesting, please don't forget to click the like button and tell me in comments what topics you would like to see. Now, let's get started. First, what do real-time updates mean and when do we need them? Real-time updates usually mean that we want to update the user interface in real-time, new real-time, or sometimes periodically. As front-end developers, our goal is to update the user interface to display new data to the user. And the next question is, where might we need real-time updates? Typical applications include chat applications, messengers, online games, stock applications and collaborative tools like Google Documents, Figma and others. Before we begin, let's clarify a couple of points. First, the difference between pull and push strategies. Both strategies are needed for delivering updates. Pull is when the client requests updates from the server, for example, short and long polling. Push is when the server sends messages to the client, for example, server sent events and WebSockets. In simple words, push is when the server initiates the update, and pull is when the client is the initiator. Next, let's discuss Comet. Comet is an umbrella term encompassing techniques and technologies that create a long-hold HTTP connection to push messages from the server to the client. It includes long polling, server-set events, and others. You might think that everything about WebSockets and other techniques is already well known. Why should we revisit them? I noticed that major part of articles about real-time updates look very similar. Short polling is very ineffective, just don't use it. Long polling, use it if the browser doesn't support WebSockets. Server sent events, unnecessary if WebSockets exist. And WebSockets, it's progressive, it's fast, use them for real-time updates everywhere. Based on numerous articles and tutorial videos, it's often challenging to understand why we need anything besides WebSockets if it's supported by the browser. Let's examine why the issue might be more complex. WebSockets offer a bi-directional connection primarily designed for specific cases, which we will explore later. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. You may ask, OK, if it's a bi-directional channel, why can I just use WebSockets every time when I need real-time updates? And the answer is, yes, you can do it, but it may not be always the wisest choice. Designing web applications isn't just about efficiency, it involves trade-offs. We can't blindly choose WebSockets without considering the resources required for development and maintenance. A simple analogy, building a static one-page site in React is possible, but is it a good choice? I think no. Same principle applies here. Let's consider two examples that might provoke some thought. For example, LinkedIn utilizes server sent events for instant messaging. Why they not use WebSockets? Another example is Stack Overflow. They use WebSockets to update the interface in real time for adding new posts in the feed. In such case, we don't need a bi directional connection. Why not use server sent events or polling? Why this should be matter to us during the interview? If we have a requirement to implement a real-time update, we might choose WebSockets and simply cover such requirement. However, during an interview, 
What matters most is not what we choose, but why we make the choice and why we reject other options. The interviewer expects us to be knowledgeable about alternative options, potential trade-offs and effective ways to navigate them. In other words, in my opinion, it's better to choose a solution the interviewer might disagree with, but back it up with solid arguments and demonstrate extensive knowledge. Okay, now we're ready to start. Let's look at the structure. We will start with short polling. Next, we will discuss a more advanced polling approach, long polling. Then we will examine server sent events. And finally, we will discuss WebSockets. At the end of the discussion, we will summarize everything together. Let's start with short polling. Short polling is a process where the client periodically asks the server for updates, let's say every 5 seconds. Advantages of this approach include no additional work required on the server side, it operates over HTTP, and it doesn't require a persistent connection. However, it has one very serious trade-off. It can be an inefficient solution in many cases. Let's explore why it might be inefficient. Imagine we have frequent or random updates. Sometimes they may occur every minute, other times every second. However, with short polling we have a static interval, for example, every 5 seconds. Let's see how it might work. The client sends a request to the server and receives the updated data, closes the connection and waits for 5 seconds. All updates during this period will be skipped. The next problem with short polling is the occurrence of useless requests. We send a request to the server, but there are no updates. We wait 5 seconds and try again. We send another request and again, there is no updates. That's two useless requests already and it's just the beginning. With long polling or the push approaches, we avoid making these useless requests. However, in short polling there is a risk that a majority of the requests will be redundant as there are no data updates. Despite these drawbacks, short polling can still be useful in some scenarios. The first one if we don't have access to the server's code, such as using a backend from a third-party development team that might be deprecated or not support real-time updates by design. In such cases, we have no choice but to periodically pull the server for updates. When we simply want to update data periodically and don't need real-time updates, this is relatively common business requirement. When data is updated at known interval, like every 5 minutes, here using a persistent connection might be inefficient and short polling can be very effective. And if we need the simplest, possibly temporary solution, for instance, if we lack developer resources or are unsure how a part of the app will evolve, we need the simplest and most cost-effective solution. Next, let's consider when we should definitely avoid using short polling. When real-time updates are necessary. Short polling doesn't provide real-time updates. It might sometimes appear to do so if the request interval is short, but that would be coincidental. When updates occur rarely or randomly, in such cases the majority of the request will be useless, making short polling highly inefficient. This was a brief overview of short polling. Now we can better understand when it might be useful and when it should be avoided. Next, we will examine additional factors that might affect our final solution. When choosing a protocol for network communication, it's important to consider scaling. Scaling refers to a system, network or process ability to handle an increasing workload by adding resources. There are two main types of scaling. Vertical scaling, where we add more resources like CPU and memory to a single machine and horizontal scaling, where we add more servers to the server pool. There is also a third type, hybrid scaling, which combines both approaches. We add more servers and can also increase the capacity of individual machines. 
A K element in scaling is the load balancer. It's a system component responsible for distributing incoming traffic. Simply put, it decides which server should receive a request based on various factors such as server load and others. What challenges might we struggle when scaling servers for short polling? Frankly, there are no unique problems for short polling in terms of scaling. Scaling is straightforward, aligning with short polling's simplicity. However, let's consider an example application to understand how scaling works, which will be beneficial later. Assume we're developing a stock application that needs to update stocks every minute. What if the number of clients become too large? We can simply add more CPU and memory to the server. That is vertical scaling. But what if we reach the limit? We have already added the maximum memory and the most powerful CPU, but it's still insufficient. In such case, we must switch to horizontal scaling. Scaling for long polling is not particularly difficult. Let's look at the schema. We have a stock server providing updates on stock prices. We retrieve this data and save it to the database. When the client sends the initial request, it is directed to the first server for subsequent requests. The load balancer may redirect them to a different server, say the second one. This isn't a problematic because the data is stored in the database, ensuring that all servers access the same information. You might wonder, what if we store data in the server's cache? In that scenario, it could cause a problem. However, this concern is not relevant for short polling, and we will discuss it later. The next option we will discuss is a long polling. Long polling isn't a technology, it's just a technique. The client sends a request to the server as usual, but instead of returning it immediately, the server holds it. For how long? Until new data becomes available. Only then is the data sent to the client. In practice, this simple tweak can significantly improve client-server communications. Firstly, it's much more resource-efficient compared to short polling solving the problem of useless requests. Moreover, this approach offers updates that are nearly real-time. Why not completely real-time? There is a possible delay, which we will look at later. What trade-offs does this approach have? Long polling requires a persistent connection, adding complexity. Most infrastructure is configured for short-lived connections. So, some proxy servers or other elements might unexpectedly interrupt the connection. Additional work is needed on the backend side. Horizontal scaling becomes more challenging. For instance, if a client server connection is established and the load balancer later decides to distribute the load to new servers, moving a long polling connection from one server to another isn't straightforward. This process involves several complications. Long polling operates over standard HTTP, inheriting all HTTP-related issues like overhead. It is not specifically designed for real-time updates. As mentioned before, long polling is more of a hack than a dedicated technology. It doesn't provide true real-time updates. While it's closer to real-time than short polling, methods like server send events and WebSockets are more efficient. What if an update occurs during reconnection? We might lose it, right? To avoid this, we would need to implement a message queue to preserve all updates. Some scenarios using log polling might also involve storing data on the server. If we don't use shared storage, this leads to sticky sessions, which we will discuss later. It seems like a lot of disadvantages, right? However, we didn't detail short polling disadvantages much because short polling is a very specific solution required in a limited number of cases. It certainly shares many of the disadvantages of long polling, but these are not as critical in scenarios where short polling is needed, sometimes when the simplest and cheapest solution is enough. Let's look at scenarios where long polling might be useful. We need real-time updates for all browsers. Long polling has the broadest browser support because under the hood is just a simple XML HTTP request. 
Many WebSockets and server sent events libraries use slow polling as a fallback for older browsers. Thus, if we need to support older browsers, long polling is our only option. Server messages are infrequent. In most cases, server sent events or WebSockets would be more efficient in terms of latency than long polling. But if updates weren't too frequent, the slight delay wouldn't be a problem. Remember our initial discussion. We don't always need the perfect solution. Sometimes it's smarter to step back and keep the connection simple and cheap if it doesn't significantly impact performance. You might wonder, why not just use server sent events instead of log polling? That's a spoiler as we haven't discussed server sent events yet. However, long polling remains the easiest and simplest solution for real-time updates, offering the widest browser support. Additionally, it allows the use of HTTP headers, doesn't have issues with authentication, and lets developers interact with the server in a very familiar way. That's why long polling may sometimes be preferable over server sent events. Let's consider scenarios where we should avoid long polling. We need an efficient bi-directional channel. While a bi-directional connection can be emulated using long polling and standard HTTP requests, WebSockets are better for minimal latency. The infrastructure isn't suited for multiple persistent connections. For example, if updates from a third-party service come every five minutes, maintaining constant connection for these updates is inefficient, making short polling is a better option. HTTP overhead is an issue. To minimize HTTP overhead, switching to server sent events might be more suitable. As previously mentioned, long polling may not update data in real time, especially when data updates occur during the reconnection process. Remember that long polling is not a really persistent connection. It requires a connection each time, and while it often perceived as persistent, these reconnections do occur and can cause delays. Let's look how it works. The client initiates a long polling connection with the server. When an update occurs, the server sends it to the client. But what if another update happens simultaneously? In such cases, we can't immediately send the second update following the first one. We must re-establish the connection, and only then we can send new data to the client. While such delay is usually not critical, it can be problematic if minimal latency is required. Next, let's explore how we can scale servers that provide long polling. Scaling in the context of long polling is a more interesting challenge. Before we dive in, it's crucial to understand the difference between stateless and stateful server architectures. A stateless architecture means that no data is stored on the server. In contrast, a stateful architecture involves keeping some data on the server. The advantage of stateless server is a flexibility. We can easily replace such a server, redirect its request to another server, or perform other actions. Now let's consider scaling in a stateful architecture. The load balancer decides to redirect it to the first server. Suppose we are using long polling for a process like loading progress, which is maintained in the server's memory, not in database. At some point, the server sends an update of the loading process to the client. The client updates the interface and sends a new request to the server. However, for some reasons, the load balancer redirects this new request to a second server. The problem is that the second server doesn't know about the ongoing loading process. Therefore, we need a mechanism to ensure that the load balancer consistently directs requests from a specific client to the same server every time. The first solution is to use sticky sessions, which we mentioned earlier. A sticky session is a technique that forces the load balancer to redirect requests to the same server based on the client ID. To achieve this, we maintain a map of clients and servers in the load balancer. 
The next time the client tries to establish a connection, the load balancer will know which server to direct the request to. The second solution is using shared storage. By having an additional place to store data, we can render our server stateless. Which approach is better? Sticky sessions are only necessary when implementing a stateful architecture. However, if the server goes down, sticky sessions will not help us to save the data. We might also consider a hybrid approach where shared storage is used for important data and sticky sessions for short-lived data only. Let's look on each approach. Sticky sessions is easier to implement, however, it can lead to an uneven distribution of connections between process or hosts. Data loss is still possible if the server goes down, suitable for short-lived or non-critical data like file uploads. Presents a vulnerability to targeted attacks as attacker can manipulate the load balancer to overwhelm a specific server. In summary, the problem with sticky session, they impact on load distribution across servers. Now let's look on shared data storage. More challenging to implement and maintain, does not affect load balancing, safer as data is stored in shared storage and perfect for long-lived or critical data like users' data. In summary, shared storage is more complex to set up but offers more reliable storage solutions. Why don't the same scaling problem affect short polling as they do long polling? Let's consider typical use case for short and long polling. Short polling isn't used for real-time updates. For example, in an analytics applications, data on the server would typically be updated via the database not stored on the server. In opposite, long polling might be used for tracking real-time file uploads where a stateful architecture makes sense because data has short-lived nature. Therefore, issues related to sticky sessions are generally not applicable for short polling as they are used in different scenarios. The next candidate we're discussing is server sent events. Server sent events is an implementation of the comet pattern where a client establishes a connection to a server, allowing the server to send messages directly to the client. And like short and long polling, server sent events is a real technology, not just a hack. It allows the server to initiate message sending to the client. It is a push technology, not polling, because the server is the initiator of the messages, not the client. This contrast with previous methods where the client had to request updates. What advantages does server sent events offer? It provides real-time updates. Unlike long polling, server sent events establishes a true persistent connection, minimizing delay, there is no need to reconnect. Server sent events works well with most proxy servers and load balancers because it operates over plain HTTP. It has relatively lower HTTP overhead compared to polling methods, averaging around 5 bytes versus 8 bytes for traditional polling. It provides features like automatic reconnection, event names, and event ideas. If it used over HTTP2, server sent events supports multiplexing allowing multiple connections over a single TCP connection and other HTTP2 features. Connectionless pushes for battery saving on mobile devices. It's easy to polyfill server sent events for browsers which are not supported thanks to its operating over plain HTTP. And it provides a convenient and intuitive event-driven interface familiar to most front-end developers. Let's look on some disadvantages. Persistent connection requires additional server-side work. More complex server-side implementation than polling, less browser support than polling and WebSockets. Less efficient traffic consumption compared to WebSockets, which don't have HTTP overhead. Cross-domain connection need appropriate course settings. It's limited to six concurrent connections per browser below HTTP version one. More connection require HTTP version two or higher. Let's look where might server sent events be useful. Typical use cases for server sent events are similar to those for long polling, as both technologies effectively do the same thing from a user perspective, updating data in real time. 
Use cases for service end events include when a one directional channel for real time updates is needed, for frequent server messages where HTTP overhead with long polling might be an issue, and when battery life concerns as service end events support connectionless pushes allowing mobile devices to economy battery life by entering sleep mode between messages. Let's look on the cases when should service end event not be used. For bidirectional communication needs, WebSockets might be a better choice here because using service end events with an HTTP request to emulate two way communications is less efficient. For very frequent server messages, when HTTP overhead could become problematic, we may switch to the WebSockets. We will explore a simple schema to help decide which technology to use. Long polling for low update frequency scenarios. Server send events for medium update frequency scenarios offering better traffic efficiency. And WebSockets for high update frequency scenarios, which we'll discuss later. Let's look on examples of real-world applications where server send events can be useful. Real-time notifications for news or social feeds live updates for sport events, cryptocurrency prices, or real-time analytics, progress updates for long processes, and server statistic monitoring like uptime, health, and running processes. There are just a few of the many possible applications for server sent events. The final technology we will discuss today is WebSockets. WebSocket is a bidirectional channel that enables communication in both directions client to server and server to client. This feature makes WebSockets unique. Although we can emulate a bidirectional channel with long polling or service end events plus a standard CP request, WebSockets offer this functionality natively. What advantages do WebSockets have? They provide a bidirectional channel. WebSockets offer lower latency and reduced message overhead as they operate on a protocol separate from HTTP. It has better browser support compared to server sent events. It supports binary data transfer, which reduces payload size compared to text on the methods. It also means that we can transfer binary data such as meta files. And WebSockets can connect to a server from a different domain without course requirement. Despite these benefits, implementing WebSockets also has its disadvantages. It's more complex to implement and maintain than other methods. It runs on different protocols, WS and WSS for secure WebSockets, potentially causing issues with some proxy servers, firewalls and load balancers that only work with HTTP. It lacks support for HTTP features like multiplexing, browser support is not as high as for polling methods, and horizontal scaling involves additional complexities. Let's explore scenarios where WebSockets would be very useful. When we need a bidirectional channel, if an application really needs such connection, WebSockets should be a good choice. And for maximum efficiency. As we saw in the previous section, even if bidirectional communication isn't necessary, WebSockets can be implemented to achieve lower latency and reduced overhead. Next, let's consider when we should avoid using WebSockets. If bidirectional communication isn't actually needed, in many cases we need just near to real-time updates and making WebSockets an overkill. If the existing infrastructure isn't ready to handle the WebSocket protocol, in such cases downgrading to server sent events plus HTTP requests might be more feasible. When specific features of HTTP2 or server sent events are required, WebSockets doesn't operate over HTTP, therefore it doesn't have benefits of HTTP2 and HTTP1. If the risks are not fully understood, it's important to remember that WebSockets use a different protocol, which might lead to unpredictable challenges, as most IT infrastructure is designed to work with HTTP. Here's the list of applications where the use of WebSockets might be very useful. Collaborative tools like Google Docs or Figma, multiplayer games and chat applications. What's common between these applications? They require real-time interactions between users where minimal latency is crucial. 
In such cases, it's not just about subscribing users to updates, but also allowing them to actively send messages to the server. Applications where users need to both receive and actively send messages are well suited for WebSockets. You have likely heard that WebSockets are very efficient, but what does that mean? Let's look on graphic that compares the overhead of WebSockets to other methods. WebSockets provides minimal overhead, especially when compared to polling methods. However, it's crucial to consider trade-offs. While the visual difference between long polling and WebSockets may seem significant, in reality, if messages are infrequent, this might not be a big problem. In opposite, in scenarios like multiplayer games where interactions are highly frequent and intensive, even the smallest overhead can be critical. We often mention that implementing WebSockets is complex, but what does this mean in practical terms? One major challenge with WebSockets is scaling. Before diving in, I should mention that server-side events and long polling face similar scaling issues. However, long polling inherently includes a reconnection, and server-side events also allows automatic reconnection if the connection drops. In contrast with WebSockets, reconnection logic must be manually implemented. Let's look on this example. A client establishes a connection with a server. Another client also connects to the same server. As server load increases, the cloud provider decides to distribute the load between two servers. To do that, we have no choice but to drop the connection with one server and establish it with another. An important aspect to note is that WebSocket connections aren't maintained through the load balancer. They are used only for establishing the initial connection. Afterward, the client and WebSocket server maintain a direct connection. When reconnection is necessary, it must go through the load balancer again, similar to server sent events. The next problem with WebSockets is that we need to share updates between servers. This challenge previously discussed in the context of long polling also applies to WebSockets and server sent events when working with multiple servers. To solve such problem, we can implement pub sub pattern like we did it before for long polling. A more global problem with WebSockets is that they do not use HTTP. This might seem beneficial at first because it resolves the issue of HTTP overhead. However, this separating from HTTP means missing out on many advantages of HTTP version 2 and higher, such as multiplexing. With HTTP, one TCP connection can be reused for multiple HTTP connections, which is very important for handling multiple tabs. In contrast, WebSockets require opening a new TCP connection for each WebSocket connection, potentially leading to inefficiencies. Let's consider a chat application as an example. These apps usually offer group or some chat features where receiving updates for each group in real time. We have two main options how to implement it. We can use multiple WebSocket connections, which means maintaining multiple TCP connections. This approach is more reliable and easier to maintain because each group is independent. However, it can be highly inefficient. Or we can use additional information, which we will add to each message, allowing the reuse of a single WebSocket connection. However, this method is less reliable. If the single connection fails, the user will not receive any updates. Additionally, this adds overhead to each WebSocket message, which we initially tried to eliminate by implementing WebSockets. In scenarios with multiple tabs, each tab opens its own independent WebSocket connection and as a result its own TCP connection. In our chat example, each tab might open four TCP connections, leading to a total of eight TCP connections for two tabs. This is a common use case for applications like chat. So how we can reduce the number of connections? We can switch to long polling or server sent events. HTTP version 2 supports multiplexing, allowing a single TCP connection to be shared across multiple connections. 
we can use shared workers, which can be shared across multiple tabs, therefore sharing the connection. However, shared workers have relatively limited browser support. We can use broadcast channel to communicate between tabs. This means maintaining a WebSocket connection in only one tab and sharing data between tabs using the broadcast channel. We can use browser storage like session or local storage to share data between tabs. However, this requires a mechanism to subscribe the app to updates in these storages. Or we can simply do nothing if independent tabs are preferred. The next potential problem with WebSockets relates to infrastructure. Many infrastructure components such as proxy servers or load balancers are not configured to work with WebSockets and may block or ignore this unfamiliar protocol. One way to bypass is using encrypted WebSocket connection. Secure WebSocket connection is invisible to most proxy servers, thus preventing them from blocking the connection. Another issue with WebSockets is authentication. Cookie authentication isn't always suitable and the WebSockets API doesn't allow setting the authorization header with a token. Therefore, there is no standard way to establish an authorized connection via WebSocket, a problem also faced by server sent events as it doesn't support HTTP headers as well. Let's explore some solutions for WebSockets authentication. We can use a query parameter to send the access token. We can use cookies. We can use short-lived token to authentication. We can use SEC WebSocket protocol HTTP header. Or we can send authentication token with the first message. Placing the access token in the URL query parameters is the first method. The connection will be refused if the token is invalid. It is not the most secure approach but it can be relatively safe if we use secure WebSocket connection as request string or encrypted in transmission. And because unlike HTTP, WebSocket's URL aren't visible in the browser's URL bar, preventing users from copying and pasting URLs. However, server logs may still record the plain text request parameters and intermediary proxies might do the same. Remember, TLS only encrypts data in transit. Another approach is using short-lived tokens for authentication. This method involves a separate server responsible for issuing these short-lived tokens. Before sending a request to the server, the client received a short-lived token from the authentication servers. Even if the token is intercepted, its short time of living makes it useless for malicious actor. The downside for this method is the necessity for an additional servers to handle WebSocket-specific tokens. Another method is to send the authentication token with the first message via the WebSocket channel. The server then verifies this token and if it's invalid, the connection is closed. This method is more secure than the URL parameter approach and simpler than the short-lived token approach. However, this method is vulnerable to DDoS attacks. The connection is established first and only then is the authentication token checked. This allows anyone to open a WebSocket connection to the server, unlike the previous methods where an invalid token in the URL leads to immediate connection refuse. The simplest solution is using cookies. Since a WebSocket connection begins with HTTP handshake, cookies are possible options. For this to work, the WebSocket servers and the web application must be deployed on the same domain, otherwise the cookies won't be sent. And finally, we can use SEC WebSocket protocol HTTP header. The initial HTTP request may include this header, which can be used to transmit a token. The downside of this approach is that it isn't designed for security like the authorization header. Therefore, it could potentially be read as plain text and logged by proxy servers. Additionally, as there is no standard handling for this header, unexpected behavior may occur with some proxy servers and middleware. If you choose to use WebSockets for real-time communications, consider these recommendations. Use frameworks that offers multiple transport protocols with automatic fallback 
such as socket I.O., which defaults to long polling if web sockets are unsupported. Always deploy your real-time backend over encrypted TLS connection, improving security and helping to bypass issues with proxies and load balancers. Prefer using a WebSocket framework or library to handle numerous edge cases. Avoid using WebSocket unconsciously. They are well suited for applications requiring ultra-fast full duplex communications like online games but might be not necessary for every case. Let's summarize the key points of all the approaches that we discussed. The first one is short polling. Use cases. Updates at fixed intervals, for example, every 30 seconds or every one minute. It's suitable for non-real-time requirements. Example apps, analytic apps, stock applications. K advantages, simplicity. K disadvantages, inefficient in terms of network traffic, doesn't provide real-time updates. Next one is long polling. Use cases. Near to real-time updates, example apps, analytic apps, stock apps, and social networks. K advantages. Operates over HTTP, benefiting from HTTP2 features, broad browser support. K disadvantages. Potential delays between updates and HTTP overhead. Server sent events. Use cases, real-time updates, example apps, analytic apps, stock apps, social networks, possibly chat applications. K advantages, HTTP-based, offers unique features such as reconnection, event ID, connectionless pushes, K disadvantages, HTTP overhead. And the last one, WebSockets, use cases, bi-directional communications, example apps, collaborative tools like Google Docs or Figma, multiplayer games and chat applications. K advantages, highly efficient in network traffic, minimal delay. K disadvantages, operates over the WebSocket protocol, potentially causing infrastructure compatibility issues, lacks HTTP2 core features like multiplexing. That's all for today. I hope you found new format interesting and useful. If you think I should do more videos like these, please click the like button and leave a comment. I will include some useful links below. Stay tuned for more upcoming videos and see you next time. Bye!